something that uh, happened already this uh, kind of weekend uh, on Friday. Faith Family Church officially launched our young adult ministry, and uh, we are so excited for that. Um, they had an incredible kickoff. It was a time of worship. Uh, we took the time to pray over the, the leadership, uh, to commission them, also to really just speak to those that were in attendance, both young adults and some of us older people that were there in the house, uh, to really focus what does this season of life mean? What is it that God is calling us to be and to do? And it was an incredible time. And, uh, and so if you are a young adult between the ages of 18 to 28, it doesn't matter um, if you are married, single, if you are down a professional path or doing school, um, this is a time for them to come together. They come together on Monday nights, and um, it's here on campus. They'll be meeting um, the first three week, uh, first three uh, Mondays of the month, and then on the fourth one, they'll still meet, but they'll do what they call a kickback, just a time to kind of do some fun, have some community, build some relationships. And so if you're kind of looking at where are my people at, uh, that's a great place to do it. If you feel a tug, like, man, I remember what that season was like, and if they need a voice, if they need a presence, if they want somebody just to come alongside and encourage and just be there, you know, um, man, don't hesitate. That could be an area of ministry that maybe the Lord is going to use you to really just speak into someone's life. So we want to encourage you uh, to do that. But that information will also be um, online, and you can find that out. Um, if you have your Bible, I ask you to go ahead and turn with me today to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be looking as our main text Matthew chapter 8, and we have been in a series for this summer called Faith, and um, I was anticipating that it's just going to be like our summer series. Here we are in September. Can you believe it's September already? Is that nuts? That is just crazy, um, but there is still more. I just feel like the Lord's put in my heart, so we're going to have an extended summer uh, from a teaching standpoint. Uh, maybe it'll translate to a weather standpoint too. I don't know. But uh, how, many, how many guys are like, no, just bring me some rain. Anybody in the house like that? Like, I want some rain. Okay, five, eight of you. Do a small group. Do a small group. <laughs> and uh, you can be the rainmakers, all right? So, um, but last week, Mark Brown did a phenomenal job at just sharing so much of what God was put in him about the word of God and the importance of the word and some of the ways that we can really get into the element of getting hungry and staying hungry. How many of you guys know that that is a challenge sometimes, right? There are certain seasons in our life where maybe because of the circumstance, um, a challenge, a heartache, a struggle, and it kind of reveals, ooh, I need to lean in. And then we lean in, and guess what? God meets us. He encourages us. Um, there's a supernatural impartation. There's a strengthening. There's some breakthrough. There's some joy. And you're like, this is good. And by human nature, there's then that coasting, and then eventually it gets into a place of default, right? It's no longer by design. It's by default. And I, I believe that his message was so simple yet so powerful about how to Make sure that we stay hungry because um, it's one thing to react to a situation. It's another thing to be prepared for those situations. And I want us to be prepared. That's why we're doing this series. Let's be prepared because if you're not in a trial now, you will be. And I'm not saying that negatively. I'm saying that because we live in this world where there is some struggle. There are some, some things that we are facing, um, something that maybe... Uh, is natural, something that might be supernatural in the sense of, we even talked about the demonic, the way that the enemy would love to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need to be aware of all these schemes and to build ourselves up and to be prepared for this. We don't need to be in fear. We get to operate in Christ, who is our everything. And so uh, today, if you're taking notes, I, I entitled this one, One Under Authority. One under authority. Like, I want to be one who lives under authority. And, uh, and we're going to be looking at Matthew 8, which is a very common text, but I think there's so many rich nuggets in that. But I want to start off by today by, by just thinking about authority for a moment. How many guys know, and, and maybe when you were younger you sensed this, maybe it, it became more of a realization when you became a parent, 
But how many guys know that if you don't learn how to submit to authority, you can have a really rough life? You know what I'm talking about? And I, some of us, we were that kid, right? We were that kid who just, you can't tell me anything. It could have been a teacher. It could have been your mom. It could have been your dad. It could have been any authority. I mean, I remember growing up, I was born in 73. So really the 80s and early 90s were, were kind of my eras of very like influential seasons of life. And, um, and music was a big thing. I remember when rap, especially like gangster rap came out and I gravitated towards that. And a lot of that rap um, had a lot of just coming against authorities and slandering. And, uh, and it kind of like, it, it grew a mentality of like, you can't tell me nothing. And I mean, I could quote some of the lyrics, but they would be bleeped out, right? I mean, that's just what it was. And I want you to know that the enemy doesn't want you to understand the power and the importance of being under authority because it's when we are under authority if you come under authority meaning you submit or you humble yourself the bible says that when we humble ourselves he gives us more grace to lift us up if we feel like no i've got to prove myself and nobody can tell me what to do and we take on the stance of pride and we 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 you know shake off or we kick against the goads if you will is another way to say this then really what we're doing is we're making ourselves susceptible for the enemy to wreak havoc in our lives. And so we're gonna be looking at how authority and faith go hand in hand and the importance of this in our life. Um, before we read Matthew 8, I wanna look at a verse in Matthew 16 that many of us have heard, but I think it's a great springboard into our, our text today. And Jesus was with his disciples and he took them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, this was kind of a, uh, uh, in the area around the Sea of Galilee, there was a place called Caesarea Philippi, but it had um, Roman rule, just the phrase Caesarea, and this place was, was set apart, and there, all the, um, all the way that they worshiped, the Roman people worshiped with all their many gods, this was a place where there was many gods that were being worshiped all around. I had the privilege of going to um, Israel several years ago and going into this region of Caesarea Philippi, uh, there was a lot of cliffs and in these cliffs you could see carved out areas up top where they would actually put in these statues or these things that were created carved by hand so that when people came in they recognized these gods that were there and you would go to whatever place to pay tribute to your gods. They also had uh, this big cave that had like this little brook and it went into the rocks and it dove down and that was what they would consider uh, uh, the place of Hades. It was the entry point for the potential of, of where hell and the demons. As a matter of fact, if there was somebody that was in trouble and the way that they did trials, they would bring them on top of this massive cliff with the brook about 20 feet down and they would, ha they would hold this trial and if somebody proclaimed that they were innocent um, and there was question of guilt, they would actually then push them off this cliff and they would fall into this brook and um, if they survived and could get out, then they were innocent. <laughs> Otherwise, that was where the gates of hell would prevail. So Jesus takes his disciples there and he's looking at everything, and, and this is probably the equivalent of this is probably the equivalent of us going down to like Vegas Strip, and we would be inundated with all the gods that are being displayed there. We would maybe feel out of place. We would feel embarrassed, awkward, like filthy. And so Jesus asked them two questions. The first question was who do they say that I am? And they replied, like, well, some believe that really you're, you're a prophet, kind of like a Jeremiah or Elijah or whatever it may be. And then he asked a second question, which is the question I want us to lean into as we go into our text, but who do you say that I am? And it was at that point where Peter answered, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus gives this comment. After Peter makes that comment, he says this, and I say to you that you are Peter. 
and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you, I will give you what? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This text, even though, even though it doesn't use the word authority, is painting a picture of what authority looks like. Authority was being given to those who believed, Peter being the one who made the profession of, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's upon that confession of faith, Jesus said, I will give you keys to the kingdom. Keys would unlock or lock. They would loose or they would bind. And that's a picture I want us to think about as we're reading this text. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have been given authority. We have been given the keys of the kingdom. It all starts by us answering the question, but who do we say that he is? And who we say he is will help us understand who we are. That's a huge key to this. Understanding who he is, I believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was from that confession that Jesus now says, now this is who you are. So when we understand who he is, we begin to understand who we are and the authority that he has given to us. Um, we don't just understand authority and submission. Like this is not just a head thing I want us to teach, but this is something that helps us strip off foolishness and pride that we have in our lives so that we can walk and experience the blessings that God has for us and to be the liberators to those around us. Now we are not a savior, but we are ambassadors. We represent the kingdom of heaven and we have been given the authority to loose and to bind, not just for ourselves, but for those around us who are not knowing who he is. Now, this is the big idea I want us to, to build off of, and it's this. The Lord has given every believer authority, and it's our responsibility to use it. So I think we can say amen to the first part pretty loudly, like God has given every believer authority. And we're like, amen, that's awesome. But here's the thing, with authority comes responsibility. What good is it to have the keys if you never engage them? This is yes for us, but it's also for others. And I, I pray that Part of what this series is doing is it's stirring us in our faith to recognize, I do not want to live. I am, I'm not even called to live a status quo life. I'm called to live a life more abundantly, and that life more abundantly comes through a relationship with Christ, knowing who he is, therefore knowing who I am, and in knowing who I am, I recognize I'm not common, I'm not ordinary, I'm extraordinary. Now, that's not a prideful statement. That's understanding. In Christ, that's who he's made me. I'm not putting on a self-arrogance. I'm not putting on a self-confidence. I'm putting on the righteousness of God. I'm putting on what he has called me, called you. And the question is, are we walking in that? Are we living in that? Are we using that? So um, accessing all the things of God's kingdom, his grace, his favor, we access those things by faith. I know that Brother Mark, last week, he made this statement, and I loved it, and I wanted to quote him. We can't live, uh, leave up to God what he has left us to do. So that's kind of adding to this thought process about how God has given every believer authority, but it's up to us. It's our responsibility to use it. So God says, I've given you the keys it's kind of like, hey, God, I'm dealing with this. Will you come down and unlock this for me? And he's like, no, I've given you keys to unlock it. But, 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 no, I've given you the keys to unlock it. 
Well, I'll go to my pastor. No, 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 no. I've given you the keys to unlock it. Yeah, but I didn't go to school. It doesn't matter if you went to school. Are you in Christ? Yes. Then I've given you the keys to unlock it. Well, what are those keys? And that's maybe part of the journey we're on. And this, so this series, really, it's still just scratching the surface to so many things. But hopefully, it's stirring up a hunger and a thirst. And using Brother Mark's quote last week, stay hungry for the things that God has in store for us. So every miracle, every miracle of Jesus demonstrates his authority over a situation. And I say this because I'm gonna, I wanna ask you, I wanna kinda give you an assignment, okay? This week, and I know that um, Sister Kathy shared a little bit about the Bible reading plan that we have as a church in order to, to maybe read the Bible uh, from cover to cover in a year which some of you are like, man, I've never done that before. I want to encourage you, make it a goal every year to read through the Bible because the more you're in it, the more you get it. And, but maybe this week, spend some time reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? You can read it as slow as you want or as fast as you want, but in this, what I want you to do, I want you to have this filter, the filter of this. Every miracle that Jesus did demonstrated his authority over something, okay? And I'm just gonna give you an example of some, and we're just gonna put this up on the screen. You just might wanna see it. Go ahead go to that next slide if you don't mind. Um, these are the, you'll see the column on the left is the miracles. It demonstrates his authority over in the middle column, and then this is the text, right? You can see this throughout the Gospels. So when Jesus calms the storm, Jesus was demonstrating his authority over nature. Okay, so what does this mean for us? It means that even when I'm facing natural things, I know that my God is the authority above those natural things. Can I get an amen on that? My wife and I, uh, we were actually with uh, Pastor Adam and Ruth this last week as we were taking our girls down to Arizona to go to Grand Canyon University, their second year. And uh, we were flying back on Thursday night. And uh, we got on the plane and we pull out, we taxi out from the, the, the ramp there and we're on the tarmac and all of a sudden um, we could feel the plane shaking a little bit and then the captain comes on the, the um, intercom and says, um, there is a wind advisory and, uh, and so then we looked out and there was like sand just blowing all over the place. We were in a windstorm. And then shortly after that, there was lightning and thunder or lightning, no thunder, just lightning, lightning coming down across. And so we ended up being on the tarmac for two hours. And finally, they're like, okay, we've got a window. We're going to go ahead and take it. And so we were taxing down the runway and it's going, we're getting up to speed and that plane, you can feel it fighting it. And all of a sudden the, the, the wheels come off the ground and you can feel it fighting already. And you're feeling this and like, you know, when you're on a roller coaster and you feel like that moment where you're like suspended and your stomach doesn't know where to go, like it was like that for about a solid five to six minutes as we were climbing up. Um, there were people on the plane that lost it, right? You could see people white knuckling it. I'm, I'm sitting in the plane doing my message and I'm like, Lord, you are, you have authority over nature in the name of Jesus. Right? And, and, and what it helped me do is it put me in a place of peace. Okay? Now, I, I can't do this for the sake of time. I can't do this through every single one of these things. But you'll see here, whether it be Satan and demons, sickness and disease, sin, provision or lack, uh, trials and testing, even death. I want you to know that Jesus has authority over all these things. So when you read through the Gospels and you read these, don't just think of flannel board Sunday school. That was a cool story. This is not entertainment time. Why was this written? Why was this recorded? To impart to you who Jesus is. Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Most High God. And he sits above all these things. And because he, he is seated above these things, we are seated with him. It brings an element of perspective, an element of peace. 
So when you're reading through the Gospels and you read about these miracles, it's not just for us to go, man, that, that was a really cool story. No, it should impart to us, that's my God. That's what I'm a part of. That's what he's given me keys to do. Okay? Um, so w- wanted you to have that. I uh, want us to go ahead and read our text now, Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 5 through 13. And we're going to see Jesus' authority demonstrated here. And it says in Matthew 8, starting with verse 5, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Okay, so a Roman soldier came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now, notice some of the language as we continue to read. For I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, meaning the people who I want to have this faith. Man, they don't even have it, but this guy's got it. And I say to you, that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same day hour. This is a spectacular portion of text. One of the classes I took in Bible school, and I, I, I'm just going to give you again just another slide that you might want to take a, a snapshot of. And one of the classes I took was called the Believer's Authority. And in it, it talked about the different levels or spheres of authority. Um, and you see with scripture reference there. So I'm just going to give you just kind of the, the, the yellow, obviously. The highest level of authority is lordship. Okay? And that is God. The next level is the word. Word and truth. So when we think about the highest level, God is the highest authority. His word is the next highest authority. So anything that we would face in life, when we go to God, when we see it in his word, we know this. Those have, naturally and divinely, they have authority. They have power. They have ability. They have, uh, they have the enabling to make something happen in my life. Conscience is a powerful realm of authority. Like, no one can make you do what your conscience, prompted by the Holy Spirit, would encourage you or or discourage you from doing. Customs and traditions. How many guys know that the way we do things in this country is different than how we do things in another country? And if we try to impose our Americanisms there, they're going to look at you and say, that does not have authorization here. So there's understanding about customs and traditions. There's also delegated authorities, and then there's functional authorities. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but these are things that you can search, you can study, you can understand what's going on. This is, is, I've said this before, it's moments like this where I feel like this is your Costco shopping trip. You can fill your cart with this, and this will give you something to feed on this week to come back to read those scriptures and to understand what are the different levels of authority. Now, a question that I would ask is where do we see ourselves in this? How are we operating? And there's a lot to be said about understanding how we carry our authority. 
I cannot come upon an accident scene where the fire and the paramedics and ambulance are there. I cannot, you know, race up, throw my car in park, jump out with a cape on and say, excuse me, but the, the authority of the kingdom of heaven is here. I can't do that. They have delegated functional authority in that situation. Now, there may be a time, there may be favor, there may be an ask. Can I go to an authority and say, hey, uh, do you mind if I just take the time to pray here or whatever it may be? And if I'm given that permission, then I have been given authority by an authority to operate in that situation. So it's not just this license, you can buck off all the authorities. No, 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 There are certain things we need to understand about authority. And what I want to do is I want to give us some things that help us from this text understand authority. Here's the first one. Operating in my authority is to live by faith. Right now... What I'm wanting you to understand is we are engaging, and go ahead and if you don't mind, just go ahead and put up um, the slides that have all the verses with it too. So this is from our text. This is our Matthew text. And so when we see the centurion who says, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Notice this. He recognized, this is, this is what I want you to catch here. The Roman soldier recognize Jesus who didn't have a uniform he recognized that the way that Jesus operated could not have been in his own strength he recognized that Jesus could only be doing miracles because of an authority that he was under a God that he was under so he recognized that Jesus was under the authority of a God he may have said a God, but he understood that this was not just Jesus. Jesus was under the authority of God. Jesus himself says, he says, I only do and I only say what I see and hear my father tell me to do. He, Jesus, was submitted to the authority of his father. The centurion recognized that and he goes, I'm just like that. I am under authority. I am a soldier who has a hundred people under me but I give them command as I hear command from above. So he says, I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And then later on, when Jesus replies, he says, I have not found such great what? Such great faith. So Jesus links understanding authority and understanding faith. To understand authority, you must understand faith. It's how we exercise in this access all things we access all things that god has given to us by faith because he's given us that authority to do so do you see this so when you are facing let's just put it into play when you are facing a situation let's say all of a sudden at work you get noticed hey there's going to be some cutbacks and uh sad to say i know you've been here for the longest time but you know we just have to cut we have to cut um, some positions, and unfortunately, um, your, your role is, is being terminated. In that moment, when fear wants to come in, when offense wants to come in, when you want to defend and fight yourself for that position, there's some things that I want you to understand. Don't do those things first. First, understand, God, you are the authority over them. You are the one that sits above this company. Whether that's a person who is a Christian or a Christian company or not, he is your provider. The business isn't. So instead of letting fear go, you recognize, oh, hey, Lord, if you're closing this door, I believe you're opening a different door for me in the name of Jesus. So you can look at that company that maybe wants to give you a calendar for the 25 years of service that you've worked. And you can, you can generously and genuinely go, thank you. And know with peace, God, you've got something different for me. When in our natural sense, we want to go, Pah! can you believe that? Oh, my goodness. And then we get freak out. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? No, you are operating in the natural. You have to bind the anxiety, bind the fear, loose peace, and understanding, God, you've got this. 
So in that moment, you are engaging in your faith and you're engaging in your authority. He says, Lord, I believe that if you be for me, who can be against me? You didn't bring me this far, me and my family this far, to experience lack or to be desperate. I call upon the God of Jacob. I call, upon, I call my God who shall supply all my needs. That's the word of God, right? So I'm using the word, another authority. I call on my God who shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. The economy of this world is not the economy of the kingdom of God. I operate in a different economy. You go, well, what do you put in your car? I put gas in my car. I don't put angel juice in my car. I put gas in my car. But you want to know who gives me resource to put gas in my car? My God. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're understanding these things. This is how it kind of weaves in. So operating in my authority is to live, in, uh, live by faith. Number two, faith is no respecter of persons. Faith is no respecter of persons, but faith does distinguish people. What do I mean by this? This was a centurion. Jesus, when he first came, he came, as scripture says, he came first to the Jews. So his main focus was, okay, I need to let my people, the Jews, know who I am, who the Father is, what the plan is, what, what this kingdom's all about. But it just so happened by chance that a centurion who was observing, who was watching, who had the same, can I just say this, the same revelation that Peter had back in Matthew 16 that we read. Remember when Jesus said, who do they say that I am? But who do you say that I am? And Peter said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered Peter and said, this was not revealed to you by any person, but by my Father. That same revelation came to that centurion, came to that Roman soldier. This Roman soldier who was indoctrinated in the ways of Rome saw the authority that Jesus had and said, okay, he's operating under a very different authority. And so it was that faith that allowed him to engage in Jesus. It wasn't just... It wasn't a Jew that engaged Jesus, it was a centurion, and so faith was caught by a Roman. It was that faith that was caught that was exercised, and because that faith was exercised, it distinguished him above all, even in the Jewish community. So the text that says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, and then later on Jesus says, surely I say to you, not, uh, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. What's the point? Faith is no respecter of person. A child can operate in faith. They don't have to be of a certain age. As a matter of fact, I think young children operate in faith a lot more efficiently than us older people many times. You don't have to be a Christian for 12 months or 90 days and, and, and show that you're worthy. No, no, no. You can call upon the name of the Lord. You can get this revelation and you can begin today operating in a brand new way. You don't need to go to a Bible school. You don't need to go through all four growth track classes. You don't need to do this, that, or the other. All you need to do is recognize who he is, who you are, the power of his word, and say, I want to operate like that. That's what it is. And some of us, well, you know, I just, I don't know, I just, get over it. We overcomplicate it. We, we talk ourselves out of it. We let our urgency and stresses and timeline dictate it. He is God. He sits above all things. So if you want to operate in faith, operate in it. And when you do operate in it, notice this, faith is honored, not just hard work. Hear this. Faith is no respecter of persons, but faith does distinguish between people. The person that does things by faith, I'll, I'll use an Old Testament verse. It may not sound like it's the same, but it's the same, I promise you. Not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not just being smarter. It's not just being gooder. It's not by doing harder. It's by faith. 
according to your faith, as he said, let it be done unto you. This is what God is calling us to. So whatever you're facing right now, I want to encourage you. Don't just exercise the natural, exercise your faith. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. Number three, to walk in authority, I must first be submitted under authority. This is, this is very important here. It's not, hey, you have authority, now you can do whatever you want for you. Hey, I've got authority. God says that, um, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Well, you know, I'll just drop that down a little bit. I don't want the nations. I want, a, I want a Cadillac. That's what I want. I want a Cadillac. No, he didn't give you authority so you can claim a Cadillac. He gave you authority to set people free. He gave you authority so that you can be freed. I am under authority. I, even as I preach, have the responsibility to be in alignment under his authority, his word. I study to show myself approved so I'm not speaking in my own flesh. The Bible says that when you pray, you, you pray, but you pray um, asking amiss because you want to satisfy your own desires. And the Bible says you're not going to get what you're praying selfishly for. Now, some may say, well, doesn't the Bible say that God will give you the desires of, the, uh, of your heart? Yeah, he will give you the desires of your heart when your heart is under submission to him. So when your heart desires what God wants, why would he not go, absolutely, let it be done. But if your heart's not under him, if your life's not under him, and you're just wanting it for your own, no, 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 that's, um, that is um, usurping an authority. You're being insubordinate to an authority of God. And I want to encourage us to recognize that to walk in authority must mean that I must first be submitted under authority. Are there certain areas of my life that I am not submitting to the Lord? Am I out of alignment and I'm trying to wield and use his name just for my own benefit? No, 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 no. When we think about taking the Lord's name in vain, I, I heard this as a kid growing up. You know, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I always heard that as cursing. You shouldn't swear. Now, I, I believe swearing doesn't really benefit anything, but that's not what that means. What that is saying is don't put my name on something that I haven't put my name on. Don't say, I said, when I didn't say it, and you're saying it. One of the greatest sins that many believers use is, oh, God, God said, God told me. And that's why some people freak out when they hear God said. It's because many times, I don't know if that really is what God said. Are you saying that, or are you just saying God said because you don't want anybody to question what you're saying? So don't take the name of the Lord's God in vain. Don't, don't say this is going to happen when you haven't heard from the Lord that this is going to happen. Does that make sense? Now you're saying, well, how do I know if it's going to happen? Well, are you going to your father? Saying, hey, Lord, I, this is what's happening in my family. I believe that this is what your word says. And you're coming, and you're allowing yourself to let the word wash over you, the Lord um, filter and sift the desires and the motives of the heart because that's what the word of God does. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it separates truth and the intent of the hearts. And once we get ourselves in alignment and we understand what the Lord is doing and he says, look, don't worry about that. Don't fret. I will declare. I will show myself faithful. You know that's his word and you can now proclaim the Lord's going to show himself faithful in this situation. Why? Because the word of the Lord says it. The word lines up with who he is. I, I, I felt and heard the Lord speak this to me. His word is as good as his name. And I stand on that. So these things help us understand. Get ourselves under authority. Number four, authority is carried in humility and confidence. We don't grovel at the throne of Jesus, we come confidently to the throne of Jesus. But we do it also with humility. 
So I, I know that for some of us, we probably err more so on the approach of insecurity, shame, and feeling unworthy. When, when the centurion said, I am unworthy for you to come to my house, when you actually study that out, that term unworthy isn't the, the, the concept of insecurity and, 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 and a false sense of modesty. That unworthiness is saying, no, it's not necessary. It's not worthy of you even coming because I know what authority does. Authority says something and it needs to be done because the word was sent. So it's not necessary. It's not worth you coming to my house. You can stay here, still exercise your authority, and it'll be done. Many of us, if we were the centurion in that situation, and we said we had someone that's sick, and if Jesus said, I'll come to your house, many of us would be like, Oh, thank you. But the centurion understood, no, you don't even need to do that because I understand your authority you carry. It's not necessary. So let's guard our heart. Let's make sure that we understand that we don't come with begging and insecurity, but we come hum uh, with humility and in confidence. The next one is authority or faith, and I think it was hard for me to decide which word was the most appropriate here, but authority or faith is not limited to space or time. Not limited to space or time. Right now, I'm limited in time. But notice it says that you just say the word, he said the word, and that same hour it was done. This is why when you read the book of Acts, you would see things that if, if we are to implement some of these things today, some people would call us extreme. They would maybe even call it witchcraft or hocus pocusy. But Bible says that the apostles would take even cloths that they touched or wore. It's kind of like me just taking this hanky that is full of holy sweat and saying, here. And you came to me, you're like, man, I've got someone who's sick. And if I said, here. Just go ahead and put this under their pillow. Some of us will be like, okay, first of all, that's gross. I don't know, that's not very hygienically like appropriate. But there was such an understanding back then about an impartation that the Bible says that even when that cloth was given to people who were in different places, maybe who couldn't travel and go there, that they were healed. Think about this. That's, that's a, a level of divine efficiency and effectiveness that I have yet to tap into. So I, I'm not here saying I've done this. I'm saying this is part of the journey that I'm on as well. I don't want to, I don't want, and I, I'm going to get a little vulnerable here for a moment. I don't want as your pastor to be ineffective when there is a sick loved one, when you're sick. When you're experiencing lack, when there's something that I believe that God is giving me and giving you, giving us this authority to operate in, I don't want to see the gates of hell prevail. I mean, it's been crazy thinking over this last year or so, thinking about all the things that have been happening within this body and here even lately in the last three, four, five months, People who have been diagnosed with things and, and, and things that are surfacing that are kind of coming out of the blue. And quite frankly, there's, there's a side in me that goes, Lord, why is all this happening? And I can get fearful about it. I look at the Henson family. I look at Dell. I look at others in this house, Philip, who have been diagnosed and given things that, that the doctor says, this is what's going on. And we see on the outside some of the physical effects of these things happening. And there's a part of me that goes, but Lord, what do you say? And sometimes I feel like, Lord, I, I don't know anything but to stand on what you said. And even when something that we're praying for, believing for doesn't happen, the natural side of me wants to go back to the drawing board and refigure out what's going on. But no, no, no. This is the time when the Lord says, are you going to lean in on me or are you going to lean on your own understanding? And so I'm in this journey with you, church. I'm on this journey with you. 
And as we said from week one, I don't want my experiences to determine my faith. I want my faith to, to determine my experiences. And so like you, I gotta fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. That's what that is. There's more to this text. I don't have time for this, but let me give you the last, if you can go to the very last slide and just put those three, three up. I think our takeaways are simply this. Have you made Jesus the ultimate authority in your life? If you haven't, submit yourself to the highest authority. Number two, is there an area of your life that's not submitted to the Lord? Is there, is there an area where there is sin prevailing? Is there an area that you're holding on to that you're trying to control yourself? I, I know some of the common things are things like money. Money is one of those things that really want to control people. I want you to know that you can, don't let money control you. Let God control the money. Some of it is the, the fleshly desires. Selfishness, pride, sexuality. These are the things that the enemy wants you to keep in the closet, but I'm telling you, you will not operate with authority with those things in the closet. You need to bring those things into the light, let God deliver you from those things, trust in him, come under his alignment, submit to him, and walk in the newness of that authority. So if you haven't submitted your life to Jesus, submit your life to Jesus. If there's an area of your life that you've been holding on to, get, let go of that area. Trust him with it. And then the third one is walk in the authority that Christ gave you. So, so I think there may be a lot of us that are like, okay, that's the life I want to live. And I don't think I'm the only one that says that's the life I want to live. I want to live in a new level of faith and authority. Then do what I have been proclaiming. Lord, that's me. I'm, wa I'm, a, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. I'm going to walk according to your word. I'm not going to react in my natural. I'm going to respond in my supernatural God-given authority that you have given to me. So when the headache comes on, my first thing is an aspirin. My first thing is I'm standing on your word. By your stripes, I am healed. This, does have, this has no authority and no place in my life. So I have to get that as my new instinct more than my natural instincts taking place. Does that make sense? So I don't know which one of these three may be your portion, but whatever that may be, let's bring it to the Lord together. I'm gonna have you, if you don't mind, would you stand with me? I know that this is a Labor Day weekend and some are like, man, I wish more people were here to be able to hear this. You know what? I'm glad that we have a recording. I'm glad that they can listen, they can watch. I'm grateful for that. But you're here today. You're not here by chance. And I believe that there is an impartation the Lord wants to give to us today. And so with those three things, if you can just put those three things up again, I'm going to start from the bottom and work our way up, all right? How many would say, no, I want to walk in my authority. I want to develop those muscles. I want to get hungry and stay hungry. And I want that to be my new learned instinct rather than my own natural instinct. If that's you, that would be your response and your prayer today. Would you just with me, would you just raise your hand? Awesome. Okay, in just a second, we're gonna pray that. Put that down. How many would say there's an area that maybe you haven't submitted that you need to submit? You're a believer. There's just an area that you haven't submitted. You've been letting shame or condemnation or, or whatever it may be, hide that. Today you wanna go, today I'm laying that down. I'm trusting him wholeheartedly with it. You don't need to confess it to me, but you know that you can lay that down today. If that's you on the count of three, would you lift your hands? One, two, three, would you list that up? Thank you so much, thank you. So good, all right. Last one. If you haven't made Jesus the leader and Lord of your life, your highest authority, you want to do that, to come under his authority. Would you, on the count of three, raise your hand, declaring, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for him. One, two, three. Would you raise your hand if that's you in the house today? Anybody today? Okay. Can't see every hand. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? 
So if you raise your hand for either one of those things, which I think across this room, I think we all raise it for at least one, would you just lift your hand back up to the Lord? And as I pray, would you also offer your own word of surrender, calling out of darkness into light, whatever that may be. Father, today, I thank you for your word that shows me not just who you are, but shows me who I am. And I want to be a person who walks by faith, lives by faith, fights in faith, where that instinct of faith is my first muscle, not my last resort. Father, help me to not only be hungry, but stay hungry and to grow in your word. This isn't to try to earn favor with you, but it's to really to rid of my fleshly nature, to crucify my flesh so I can walk in the newness of life that you call me to. Renew my mind. Renew my words. Help me see differently, do differently. Be different because I am different. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Father, for these areas that I have held on to that have been um, keeping me under because I haven't brought them under the authority of Jesus. Father, every addiction, every sin, every fear, every anxiety, every bit of shame, words spoken over from my past that I've held on to, I've let that be my label. We break that down and we surrender it in the name of Jesus to you. Father, your word says who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I declare that in my life today. I am free indeed in Jesus' name. My life truly is not my own. I've been bought with a price. So I will glorify you in my mind. I will glorify you in my body. I will glorify you in my choices. I will glorify you in how I choose to spend. I will glorify you with my words. I will glorify you in my relationships. I will glorify you in private and in public. You can have every aspect of me. And Father, today, for those that are saying, Jesus, I have been running from you, but I need to surrender wholeheartedly to you. I give you my life. I no longer run. I surrender, and in surrendering, I gain victory. And I thank you, Jesus. Be the leader and Lord of my life. As the Son of God, who died and rose again, who calls me out of darkness into light, I live for you. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray.